some, some basics of downtown economic development today, and then also about how you can sort of um, get investment ready, especially in terms of business and property development, but I'm going to um, deviate a little bit from there. I, I wander a lot. If you have questions, feel free to just uh, sort of pop in and ask them, um, or we can ask them at the end. And I thought what I would do is start by talking about why it is that downtowns kind of got into the situation that we often find them in, where they even need revitalization. Because, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, they were all pretty healthy, vibrant places. Um, I grew up on the eastern shore of Maryland in a town called Salisbury. Anybody know Salisbury? Um, or any of you named Smith? Are you my cousins? Or, <laughs> a, you know, tiny, tiny place. Um, and it was, you know, it was a really, it was a really packed place on weekends. It was where everybody went to kind of to hang out and, and do their shopping, meet their neighbors. Um, my father and my, my grandmother worked in the downtown area. My uncle had a jewelry store there. So I was there a lot. Really, really loved it. Um, when I got into junior high school, something bad began happening to downtown Salisbury. And at the time, I didn't know what it was, except that businesses were dying and buildings were beginning to look kind of ratty. And when I got older and started paying attention to what was happening, not just to Salisbury, but to downtowns across the country, I realized that it was really a combination of several things that were happening more or less at the same time, but that were kind of unrelated. Uh, the first of those was the advent of Euclidean zoning, um, named after a court case involving Euclid, Ohio, not after the Greek mathematician. Um, but basically, Euclidean zoning separates out different land uses from one another in a community. And it had really good intentions. They developed it in the 1930s, uh, 20s and 30s, as a way to separate uh, noxious fumes and pollutants from industries from residential areas and schools. Um, but what it's meant is that we've now developed this sort of bizarre zoning system where we separate out um, shopping areas from industrial areas from schools and we have residential districts that are sort of all one demographic group kind of clumped together and everything is kind of tied together by these highways and major arterials. So instead of kind of weaving your way through neighborhoods, we often have to get on a highway uh, to go just about any place. This is a community uh, in Maryland, uh, Bowie, just outside DC, that has basically grown up with Euclidean zoning, and you can see exactly what it's done to, uh, to land use. Essentially, making the mixed uses that we've had for millennia in downtowns um, almost illegal in terms of zoning. Um, another of those factors that contributed to uh, some of the deterioration of downtowns was the passage of the GI Bill, which has a lot of good things in it, of course. It paid for a lot of um, uh, tuitions for uh, returning servicemen and women, but it also had a provision in there for housing, um, for paying for mortgages, uh, that, that fueled development of lots of new uh, housing subdivisions farther away from town centers uh, than they'd ever been before. Um, the passage of the Interstate Highway Act of 1956 played into this too, building tens of thousands of highways that made it easier for people to travel a little bit farther uh, to go shopping or to go to work or to conduct business. Um, the growth of the automobile industry in the 1940s, um, it was still you know, pretty unusual for a, a, um, um, a household in the US to have more than one car. Uh, by 1960, the average household had 2.2 cars. Um, it grew very, very quickly. Um, the advent of revolving credit, making it possible for us to spend more money than we actually have on retail stuff. Uh, accelerated depreciation, um, a tax benefit that has had a couple of lives legislatively over the past 30 or 40 years, uh, that basically uh, has, has um, um, provides an incentive in, the, in, in terms of writing off investment more quickly uh, to people, to investors uh, who invest money in commercial development. That pumped hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into development of new commercial centers, shopping centers. Um, all over the country. And even the creation of large um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems that made it possible to climate control larger and larger buildings. Um, until we had big HVAC systems, really it was the building itself that was the climate control system, what we could do to that building. This made it possible to, uh, to build larger things. Isn't she adorable? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so as all of this happened, people began moving farther away from town centers. They, they moved away from those neighborhoods that were immediately adjacent to the, to the downtown uh, and moved out to these new little suburban subdivisions. And as people moved, retail followed them. Retail is always a market follower. It is never a market leader. Um, it goes where people are. It puts itself in their path. It's a kind of parasitic industry in that way. It has to have traffic and exposure 
um, in order for it to survive. So the first retail that moved away, that moved out to these suburban subdivisions, was convenience-oriented stuff, stuff that you don't want to have to, to drive far to get to, like groceries and gasoline and uh, fast food and dry cleaning. Um, but it wasn't too long before we began to get um, enclosed suburban uh, shopping malls, regional shopping malls. And these shopping malls uh, completely changed how retailing takes place. Uh, they made it possible for a retailer, uh, for a manufacturer, to basically sell the same product uh, to exactly the same kind of person demographically in exactly the same kind of environment, um, physical environment, anywhere in the country. So you could be inside a shopping mall in Albany or inside a shopping mall in Sacramento, and once you were there, it would look exactly the same. You would see the same stores, the same merchandise, the same people. Completely, completely changed how retailing took place in the country. Um, and these started popping up all over the place. Um, a decade or two later, uh, big box superstores came along and again transformed how retailing takes place in the country, uh, redefining the relationship between product manufacturers and distributors, cutting out the wholesalers and changing distribution patterns. Um, and pricing systems. So all these things happen, and community leaders began to worry that something was happening to their downtowns because they were getting emptier and emptier. So a lot of communities did stuff that had really good intentions but didn't always work so well. Like things like thinking, oh, these old buildings look so antiquated, we should make them look modern like the shopping mall, so let's cover them up with stuff. Um, or thinking, hey, this preservation thing means you can pick your own history. Um, this is a community in central Georgia that went Bavarian in the 1960s. Um, they Bavarianized all the buildings. They, they taught, they, they, they like literally brought in a linguist and taught their merchants how to speak with a Bavarian accent. So kind of imagine that central Georgian and then the Bavarian over it. Really successful. Um, merchants got a little bit um, careless, you know, kind of stopped paying attention to their customers' needs. We got a little bit carried away with parking restrictions. Um, we kind of stopped paying attention to business placement, to uh, natural business clusters. And all these things, um, you know, together, obviously, I'm joking a bit there, but there were a lot of things that we tried to do that did not work very well. And these underlying changes really, really cut the economic legs out from under downtowns. And that's why we're even here talking about downtown revitalization and how to make downtown stronger again. In essence, over the course of a couple of generations, we have created a, an auto-oriented consumer culture where we do business from our cars instead of on the streets and instead of taking the time and effort and putting the tools in place that we need to cultivate locally owned businesses, these are the kinds of commercial environments that we're creating all over the country. Um, and it's left in its wake an enormous, enormous amount of vacant square footage, not just in, in older downtowns, um, but also um, along highway strips. There are now 4,500 dead and dying shopping malls and shopping centers in the US, 4,500. The shopping mall that killed my hometown downtown in Salisbury was itself demolished three or four years ago because it had become vacant. Um, and of course, that was when the market, the real estate market collapsed, and so now they've had for the past four or five years um, a big vacant uh, lot. Um, in essence, what we've done is we've created more retail space, more commercial space, than we have retail dollars to support. In 1960, we had about four square feet of retail space per person in the U.S., and now we have just over 40. It's about 41 and a half or 41.2 uh, uh, um, 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 square feet per person. You can see that the big growth happened in the 1990s. Um, the amount of space that we had almost doubled then. Why, uh, what, um, and what happened then? Uh, to an extent, but what were they investing in? What was the? Walmart. Somebody said it. Walmart. Um, big box stores. That's the, that's the decade of big box expansion, and we almost doubled the amount of commercial space that we have uh, in that 10 years alone. We only have enough market demand to support about 17 square feet per person. Um, so we have more than twice the amount of commercial space uh, that we need. Obviously, downtowns were the ones that weren't organized. They were the ones who hadn't had merchants' associations in place for 20 or 30 years um, and hadn't really been thinking about how to um, merchandise, how to market, and how to, um, uh, how to recruit businesses uh, you know, in a group as a unified way for a long time. So that was where the, the weakness in the market occurred, and that's where the vacancies popped up. Uh, by comparison, the UK, which has more square footage than anybody else in the world except us per capita, has 12 uh, square feet per capita. China has a half a square foot per person. The worldwide average is four, and we have 41.2. We are way, way overbuilt. Um, in its advice to its commercial investors last year, 
Price, PricewaterhouseCoopers said the most over-retailed country in the world hardly needs more shopping outlets of any kind. They're advising their commercial investors do not invest in new commercial real estate. We've just got too much. Um, what happened basically with shopping centers is that shopping centers sell essentially one thing. They sell apparel. They sell clothing, shoes, uh, and jewelry, and they have some things that keep you there you know, to help shop, to help you shop for those things longer, like food courts. Um, but 85, 90% of what shopping centers sell, shopping malls sell, um, is clothing. And they sell that because that's the kind of thing that people, when they go shopping, they like to go to five or six different stores and compare styles and prices and brands before they make a buying decision. So you want to go to a place where you've got several different shoe stores so that you can compare before you make a decision. That business works well um, clustered together. And so they went after that piece, and they went after it for a regional market, 20, 30 mile uh, radius, and they pretty much targeted middle income households. So that piece of the market, on this graph I've got all the stuff you can buy on the up and down axis and price points at which you can buy it on the horizontal axis, and that piece, sort of clothing, shoes, jewelry, some personal care products in the middle income uh, household group, kind of disappeared from downtowns. So we started uh, like losing downtown department stores and then started losing downtown clothing stores. Um, as that happened. Um, big box stores uh, take kind of this out of the market. This is kind of the piece that they claim. I couldn't make the PowerPoint do quite the blobby shapes I wanted, but it's more or less like that. And if you overlay that with um, what shopping malls sell, you can see why shopping malls are suffering so much now. It's because big box stores have taken a big piece of the apparel market away from them. And because apparel stores need to exist in groups of five or ten kind of clusters of similar businesses. There just isn't enough market demand left in most communities um, to support a new cluster of that. Another way of looking at this is to look, is to sort of map it out on a, on a um, map. In 1950, the retail trade area of the average small to mid-sized community in the U.S. was about 15 miles. That was as far as, as somebody was generally willing and able to travel. Um, to go shopping. And if you draw a 15-mile radii around communities, I'm picking on Iowa here because they're kind of flat and square. They're easy to do this for. Um, you, you see that there's not a whole lot of overlap. And it's actually happened that way for millennia. Communities have grown up kind of a day's business travel away from one another. Um, today, people are willing to travel up to 50 miles on average to go shopping or to go to work um, or to conduct business. And so when you increase these radii to 50-mile radi um, radiuses, you see what happens. You've got communities that are cannibalizing their neighbors for exactly the same retail dollars. Um, there's actually a tiny little spot just south of Des Moines that's uncovered. If you rush out now and open a convenience store, you can get rich. Um, what happened, in essence, is that as we create more commercial space, what happens is that downtowns kind of got sucked into this vortex of, uh, of disinvestment, where that led to vacancies popping up, which meant that uh, rents dropped because there was too much um, supply and not as much demand. Undercapitalized businesses moved in because the rent was cheaper. Property owners didn't have the revenue that they needed to rehab and maintain the buildings properly, and so they deferred maintenance. That meant that the, the buildings began to look shabby and need investment. Property values therefore dropped. Cities collected less in property tax revenue. The district began to look uncared for, and the whole cycle kind of just keeps repeating. One of the challenges in downtown development is to figure out what you know, where in this cycle does the community have the best strategic opportunity to intervene? Um, it might be with property development, it could be with business development, it could be with regional collaboration in business development. Um, what's the best strategic place where you can kind of go in and snip that and begin to reinvest, to kind of redirect that uh, disinvestment cycle? Um, it used to be that you would drive into a community and just from looking at the buildings alone, you could tell a lot about the community. You could tell something about the natural resources in the area from the building materials that were used because these were built in a time when people weren't going to ship materials from China. Um, you could tell from the architectural style something about the period of time over which the community's been evolving. You could tell from the names on the buildings something about the people who had developed uh, the community. Um, and now when you drive into a community, this is what you C. Anybody know where this is? Well, it's actually Joplin, Missouri, but you get my point. How about this one? Marquette, Michigan. Kansas, Georgia, Massachusetts, New York. They all look exactly the same. I have photoshopped out the name and logo. Do you know what the business is? How about that one? How about that one? How about that one? Isn't that creepy? 
Um, it's like the buildings themselves are now part of corporate branding systems. And when we let corporations build these, we're letting them basically scatter their logos up and down our highways, making our communities look exactly like every other community in the country, and unfortunately, increasingly in the world. Um, it's a real problem that we've lost that, that sense of architectural distinctiveness that creates economic value. One of the four forces that creates economic value is uniqueness. If there's just one of something, it's worth a lot more than if there are a million of it. And we need our communities to look like they're one-of-a-kind places again uh, and stop letting this kind of stuff go on. And we keep building more and more of this stuff. I'm going to give you a quick quiz to show you how easy this is to spot. This is called Cool Not Cool. I'm going to show you some photos, and as soon as I show it to you, yell out if this place is cool or not cool. Okay? Ready? See, it's like pornography. You know it when you see it, you know? We know what's cool. We know what it is. We just have, you know, have to figure out how to get that uh, and stop developing the not cool stuff in our community. Um, there are three kind of trends that I wanted to talk about. Then I'm going to talk about five sort of ideas, sort of five, five suggestions for, for getting things going. Three trends that I think are, that I'm seeing in my work really are shaping um, how downtowns are likely to evolve in the next 10 or, 10 or 15 years. Um, the first of these is the market impact of millennials. Millennials are basically um, digital natives, people who have grown up using the internet and who are now in their 20s, roughly. They're sort of early to, early to late 20s. Um, they are shopping in completely different ways than their parents and grandparents did. Um, and within the next five years, they're going to become a major market force in the country because they're going to be entering that sort of age cohort where they're establishing households, buying major consumer durables. Um, and uh, gaining a majority in terms of uh, spending power. Um, millennials are different in lots of ways. They, uh, they spend less money on things than their parents did. They tend to buy higher quality things, but they spend less in general. Uh, they're very concerned about environmental issues, and that guides their decisions about what to buy and where to shop. Uh, they want to know where things that they buy come from. Um, this is an example of a skateboard company that puts a QR code on every skateboard so that you can scan it and know exactly where the materials in that skateboard um, originated. Um, they repair things rather than throw them away. They resource things. Um, this is a, a little company now that's taking old luggage that they buy at yard sales and on eBay and turning them into boom boxes. Um, they support locally owned businesses. They share things rather than buy them. They rent things rather than buy them. This is a company online where you can rent a designer handbag, so you don't have to invest a fortune in owning one. You can just rent it for an event you're going to, and then you can send it back. They buy things that last longer. This is a company that's making um, men's clothing that's meant to last for several generations. So everything that you buy has a, a label inside it, and that label has blanks in it where the first owner writes in his name and the date he acquired it, and the second owner writes in his name and the date he acquired it. Basically, it's becoming chic to have something that is multi-generational um, and has been reused. Um, they like living near their workplaces, they like living in downtowns, and they like working near their homes. They, they want their jobs and businesses to be together. Again, environmental concerns, everything else, they don't want to spend time in a car. Um, they want to meet their neighbors, they want to be on the streets. Um, this is why co-working spaces are popping up all over the country um, with all kinds of interesting variations. Um, they highly value interactivity and direct engagement, and this is going to be very, very important. Um, I heard this guy give a speech a few years ago, and he was talking about uh, some research that some sociologists had done, where they found that, the, that literally the brains of people who have grown up using the internet work differently than the brains of people who have learned how to use the internet, even if they just learned them as little kids, five or six years old. Um, that they're sort of wired to work the way that, you know, it works when you're, when you're surfing around for something online. You can go deep, you can go wide, um, and you help shape the experience as you go along. And when I heard him talk about that, I began paying attention to what I was seeing in downtowns, and lo and behold, I'm seeing a lot of interactivity of people, younger people directly involved in shaping uh, the experience of being in a downtown, or even in a shopping mall for that matter. Um, in lots of fun ways, and communities are responding. This is a community that just put a bunch of rocking chairs out on the street, um, and they were filled within, within minutes. Uh, this is a place where they had an artist embed these bronze dance steps with directional arrows in the sidewalk. So you're walking along, you see this, you suddenly do a little foxtrot, um, and then you go on. Um, this is paint. These are not real um, birds. That's not real water. Uh, there's a crosswalk painted like a, 
um, a keyboard, just things that make the experience of walking along one of discovery, uh, something that's, that's out of the ordinary that you're not going to find someplace else. Having activity in motion in storefront windows is incredibly important. When people get to a blank spot or a space that's, that has window shades in it, they perceive that that's the end of the commercial district and they, they're, they're, they're less inclined to continue on. This is a district that um, decided to ask every business downtown to put something active in the window. This was a dry cleaner that put um, uh, their tailoring station in the front window so that when you're walking along, you see somebody sewing in the front window. Of course, she'd gone to the restroom when I walked by to take the picture, but normally she's there. Um, this would put you on the map. This is a public restroom made of one-way glass. So when you're on the outside looking in, you don't see anything, but when you're in the inside looking out, you see the entire street. People come from miles around to see but not use it. Um, this, is a, this is a cool fence where when you look at it, uh, from this direction, head on, you don't see anything, but as you look at it from an angle, a face emerges. You know, just really subtle, small scale, uh, small touch things. This is a, um, an electric traffic, um, electric switching box in Nashville. When you uh, um, um, walk by it, each one of these has a speaker built into it that's motion activated, so when you walk by, you suddenly are sort of engulfed in this little bubble of music recorded by Nashville artists, um, reinforcing uh, a sense of place. And millennials love interactivity and video is an easy way to do this. This is a vacant storefront where they let a, this, this you know, company, this uh, group of students um, put in a, a, an exhibit and they, they partnered with a clothing manufacturer to feature the clothing manufacturer's clothing. In essence what it is, is um, a rear projected video uh, they filmed this guy, I'll show you in a second how they did it, filmed him against a green screen, just doing these sort of leaps and acrobatics, and then they're, they're showing it from up above onto a screen uh, in front of the storefront window, and there's a heat sensor on the street, so when somebody walks by, they trigger this, um, and the person on the street is what's making the activity in the window. Totally freaks people out, you know. Um, but kids love it. They will spend hours in front of this. And it's really, really simple to do. There's the guy being filmed on the green screen background. And they just filmed him doing, you know, a few, a few leaps around. And it's on a, a constant loop. And this is, um, this is how it's set up. Uh, you could do it uh, relatively easily. Geotagging. Uh, millennials love uh, sort of telling stories about the places that they love. This is a program called the Yellow Arrow Project. You can see in the lower right-hand corner that there's a yellow arrow sticker on a parking meter that's pointed at this coffee shop. Um, and the yellow arrow sticker has a telephone number on it and a code number. And the person um, who put this there, you know, has some great story to tell about the coffee shop, puts the sticker on, dials the number, punches in the code, and records his or her story. Anybody else coming along can then dial that number, punch in the code, and hear that same story. Um, really, really brings a place to life by telling these um, these stories about it, and that's happening um, all over the country. There are about, I don't know, 70 or 80 communities involved in Yellow Arrow right now. Um, millennials like shaping how the, how the community is going to be used, how the how the how the buildings are going to be used. This is uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, where they had this um, this this vacant uh, former um, sort of mixed use, some apartments. Uh, some hotel rooms and some offices building called the Polaris Building, and it was vacant. And they brought in an artist who called the project for looking for a new a new use for it, looking for love again. Put a sign up, and on the ground floor, she installed these two chalkboards. On one corner, uh, along one side, it asked people to record their memories of the Polaris Building, and on the other side, it asked them to write down their hopes for the Polaris Building. And every day, she would go out and take a photo of the things people had written up, um, and over the course of um, a few weeks, there was sort of community consensus about some of the, the potential uses that they wanted to then explore and see if there was market viability for them because the people were really behind these ideas. In essence, crowdsourced um, ideas for reusing the buildings. Um, another variation on this, exactly the same artist uh, created these stickers that says, I wish this was, uh, and let people write on what, what they wanted a space to be and put it on, just you know, um, um, slap them on the, the plywood covering the storefront window, a bike shop, a Chinese restaurant, a grocery locally owned owned by someone who cared um, to develop interest. So sort of major trend number one. Major trend number two is community capital. And Amy's going to be talking about this a lot um, in her noon, noon presentation today, so I'm only going to hit on it briefly. But getting direct investment from people in a community to shape what you want the district to be is becoming a very, very hot, big thing. And it's growing all the time, whether it's a local investment group uh, that gets together. This is a group of investors in Illinois that banded together to create this restaurant that they kind of wanted to see, there's the guy, the guy that they hired to uh, operate it. 
This is an example of a community that was a um, tiny, tiny town in western Kansas out in the prairie that was in danger of losing this little uh, regional um, department store chain that they really wanted because if they were gone, they were going to get Walmart, which they didn't want. So the community actually bought the building and gives the space to the uh, to department store rent-free uh, to stay there. And of course, using things like Kickstarter and Indiegogo um, to raise money. This is an example of a bakery um, that raised all the money that it needed for startup um, on Kickstarter, essentially selling things like the naming rights to uh, its espresso machine and, and muffins it was going to be selling, um, as well as other things. And the third sort of big thing is multiple distribution channels. Um, I thought that the mayor did a, did a good job in his intro comments this morning about talking about how the community, you know, the world is really global now, um, business is global. It is so, so true. Um, I buy most of my shoes from this guy in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Anybody ever been to Oskaloosa? Somebody has, wow. Not many people have been to Oskaloosa. It's not exactly on the tourist trail. Um, and I was there 25 years ago uh, for a business meeting. They were starting a Main Street program, and I was there to help them get it going. And I was in a hurry, zooming down the, the street downtown um, to get to this meeting. And out of the corner of my eye, I see in this, this shoe store's window a pair of Rockport pumps that I had a pair of and really, really loved. And I went in and I said, if you've got those in six and a half medium and navy blue, I'll buy them right now. I don't need to try them on. Here's my credit card. So he had them, and he sold them to me, and I went on my merry way. Um, a month later, I get a call. He's tracked me down at my office in Washington, and he says, um, I just got in a shipment of those rock ports that you like, and I put aside a pair in every color in your size in case you need more. <laughs> like, I love this guy. This guy has called me every three months for 26 years. Um, <laughs> it's probably like the longest relationship I've had in my life. He, um, about, about 10 years into our relationship, he sent me a foot imprint kit, you know, so he knows my feet better than I do. I'll get, I'll get things in the mail from him, you know, a box of shoes saying, I just got in this new, this new brand. I thought it looked like you, thought you'd like it. It runs a little small, so I'm sending you a seven. Um, if you like it, just shoot me an email and I'll charge your credit card. And if not, here's a FedEx label you can print out and return it to me. I love this guy. Um, I saw him for the first time three or four years ago. They hit their 20th anniversary of their Main Street program and they tr trotted me back out to see what they'd done. And I saw him. I hadn't seen him in all those years. And I, I asked him how many customers like me he had because I kind of figured out that if he had like, you know, 200 customers like me, he probably didn't need a local customer, which was good because there just aren't many there. And, um, and he said, I probably got, I don't know, 1,000, 1,200 customers like you. I was there once and he turned me into a life, lifetime customer. He doesn't even have a website. Um, but he's found a way to maintain that relationship and sell something to people who are not physically walking in his bricks and mortar store. Now when you think about the kinds of visitors who come to the Erie Canal and to this area and the opportunities that are just, you know, right there for the taking, if business people are really savvy and on board and paying attention to, ah, business is not anymore conducted by people coming into my store, it's actually, you know, those are, those are people who kind of flow through that I can connect with, but I can find many customers out there in the world in different ways. Whether it's through making deliveries, you know, to people in the community so they don't have to come visibly to the store. Whether it's, this is a, I love this, this is a, a butcher shop who puts a vending machine in front of his store so when he closes up his store at night at 4.59 p.m., um, he, can, uh, he can load it up with fresh hamburger and fresh steak and you can come by and get, uh, it's, it's refrigerated, it's totally fine, um, and get fresh meat for dinner. The internet, of course, has made it possible for people to sell just about anything from anywhere. This is a guy who has a scuba shop in, um, in Texas. And um, his website uh, basically just has this webcam in it. And what you do is you call him on the phone, completely translating the experience of a locally owned merchant who really knows his stuff into a virtual experience. You call him on the phone and say, I'm looking for a new pair of flippers. What do you have in stock? And he holds them up to the camera and walks you through them, through each one, and, and tells you what the pros and cons. And then when you decide what you want, you like see him box them up literally and put them in the mail um, to you while you're there watching. Um, this is a, a cool variation. This is a, um, a yarn shop that realized that the community that it was based in didn't really have enough market demand to support it, but if it traveled around to the 10 nearby communities, kind of rotating that a half day a week, um, that there was enough market demand. So they're now a mobile uh, yarn store. Um, another great internet success, this is a guy who makes um, Handmade concert harps. He's in downtown Rising Sun, Indiana. Um, pretty much everybody in Rising Sun who needed a handmade concert harp has gotten one by now. Um, 
his market is not local, it's global. And people find him by word of mouth and they find him online. But the experience of having him there is so fabulous for the community because you walk down the street and you hear this harp music wafting out over the sidewalk and you can wander inside and he'll show you all about you know, how he makes these harps and give you the whole tour. And um, he sells t-shirts that say love a harpist, there are only 82 strings attached, which is nice. Um, <laughs> But you know, completely, completely virtual global market, but a fabulous business to have in a downtown. And he wants to be there because the quality of life is so great. He likes being in a small town. Um, he likes being able to walk to the bank and the post office and office supply shops and restaurants. So those are the three sort of trends that I see beginning to really shape how downtowns are going or could be going. I want to talk about five things that you can do to really sort of get investment going in your communities. And I'm focusing mostly on real estate but um, the same applies to an extent to business development. Um, the first is to know how you're going to reuse the buildings. I know that sounds you know, kind of logical, but you would be surprised how many communities really don't know that. They rehab buildings without knowing how they're going to be reused and without really understanding what the market is. This has to be based on like real numbers. You have to be looking for things that have market viability and have community desire, things that the community wants and that, that and, 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 and that you know, somewhere, either locally or within that virtual plan of multiple distribution channels, um, there's actually dollars to support. Really, really critical to understand that before you launch in, because nobody's going to want to invest in building rehabilitation um, not knowing that there's going to be um, a tenant group there uh, to draw upon. Um, second is funneling new development downtown. We continue to build so much you know, new commercial space outside town centers. Um, and that's exactly what weakens downtowns. We need to get that development funneled um, into the downtown area. And that, for the most part, means um, you know, revising planning and land use laws, making sure, you know, just going through our zoning codes and making sure that they really are as downtown friendly as possible, that we, are, that we are encouraging people to locate downtown and discouraging them from locating um, out on the highway stri strips. And going hand in hand with that is making it easy uh, to invest downtown. Often downtowns are the hardest places to invest. Um, our zoning is stricter. We have design review processes. I'm not saying design review is bad. I just think it needs to be universal for the entire community so that the downtown isn't singled out as the place where the entry barrier is harder. It should be as hard you know, as stringent to build something out on the highway strip. We want new buildings to continue local design traditions and continue to strengthen the economic value of design in our communities and not diminish it over a period of time. Um, so we need to really make it easy to invest in downtowns. I think of development dollars as like water that flow to the path of least resistance. Um, and if we make downtowns the easiest place um, and offer the most incentives there, then the market will naturally begin to drive development uh, into the downtown area. Um, we need to find or develop the right tools, make sure that the right um, incentives, the right financing packages uh, are in place uh, to support this. Um, and that often means making more capital available. You know, lenders are often a little bit nervous and queasy about investing in making loans for, for projects in downtowns whose economies aren't really booming, um, investing in historic buildings. So we might need to augment that and just make sure that enough capital uh, is available there in the form of loans or equity. Uh, closing financing gaps um, to make projects uh, happen. Obviously, the historic rehab tax credit uh, is a great tool for that. That often means helping property owners figure out how to use the tax credit and make it kind of effortless for them. Uh, financing projects that need to happen for other development to occur. Uh, encouraging certain types of development to occur. Um, those are all things that go into um, making that work. Um, and here are just some examples of kind of cool, cool uh, tools that I've seen communities use. This is um, uh, in Louisville, Kentucky, where they have a, um, a downtown housing fund. This is a building called the Levy Building. It was an old department store uh, that was rehab using this. And in essence, what they did was they wanted to get upper floor housing uh, developed. Because when you have housing in a downtown area, then you've got a built-in uh, group of customers for the businesses, you know, 24-7. The district is safer. Um, you've got um, uh, um, fewer parking needs because you're not, you're not drawing people from longer distances to shop. You're relying on people who are already there on foot. Lots and lots of benefits. So they offer all kinds of tax incentives. Um, in essence, I think it's about $10,000 per unit um, in incentives to, uh, to get property owners to um, rehab buildings downtown and turn the space into housing, upper floor housing. And that $10,000 that the community puts into it, they regain in a couple of years um, because of the increased property value uh, there. Um, this is in uh, Hayes, Kansas, where they have um, 
uh, lower interest rates, not so much of an incentive now as it used to be, but this translates directly into points off the mortgages um, that these people get. And this is a company called Descent Fournier that makes um, high-end housewares. The guy had grown up in Hayes or grown up uh, just outside Hayes and decided to come back because the incentives they were offering and the natural sort of lower prices of property there made it kind of a no-brainer for him to locate his, his uh, business there. Exactly the same thing essentially happened um, in Greenwood, Mississippi when Viking Range decided to locate there and transform that community. Um, uh, things like wave development fees. This is in Shreveport, um, Louisiana, where they have a, a program that waives building uh, permit fees for, uh, for all buildings in the community that are built before 1960. Uh, basically giving an, an, an extra oomph uh, for somebody investing in a historic, uh, historic building. Property tax abatement, uh, this is in Seguin, Texas, where they uh, abate property taxes for five years for um, building rehabilitation in the downtown area and for new construction of the downtown area. Special overlay zones that provide extra benefits, this is in Winchester, Virginia, um, where they have a downtown technology overlay zone, which has just a bundle of incentives. No one thing that would knock it out of the park and make a business decide to locate there, but you put them all together, and it makes it a pretty powerful tool. And in the, I don't know, 10 or 12 years since they've had this overlay zone in place, they've attracted over 1,000 um, high-tech workers into the downtown area, and companies, obviously, um, mostly located in upper floor spaces and side street peripheral locations. Um, pictures appeared, same thing in South Boston, Virginia. Um, LaGrange, Georgia offers facade grants, uh, grants of between five and $10,000 per building in conjunction with business planning training that they do for the tenants of the buildings, um, tying those two things together. Tax increment finance, a great way to pay for something to make something else happen. This is an example from a larger city from Baltimore. This is their Hippodrome Theater where they were in this kind of bind where the city zoning code said, if you're going to reuse this building as a theater, you have to have, I think it was 230 some parking spaces on site, and they were saying, well, what are we going to do, tear down the theater to build the parking spaces? We can't do that, um, and we can't afford to make it happen. So the city said, we'll use tax increment finance and basically dedicate the, prop the, 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 the increased property tax revenue that we're going to get from a rehab theater for the next 20 years into a bond right now to pay for construction of a parking garage adjacent to the theater, and those things happen in tandem. Uh, on a smaller scale, Woodruff, South Carolina, um, a tiny town has used tax increment finance to pay for streetscape improvements and for free Wi-Fi in the downtown area. And the Wi-Fi is used there mostly by the businesses, not so much by the customers, but it's made it possible for a lot of their businesses to suddenly have pretty robust websites they didn't have before. Um, technical assistance. This is an example from Wisconsin where the state offers uh, free design assistance to the owners of historic commercial buildings um, in communities there to help them figure out how to do it. Um, and of course, community capital, which we'll be hearing more about a little bit later. Forgivable loan programs. This is an example from Waterville, Maine, but these are popping up all over the country. Again, funded by tax increment finance, so they have this pool of money. And what they do is they'll, they'll make loans to businesses that are high priorities based on their market research. So the, the district, the community does market uh, analysis, figures out, you know, these are the top 10 businesses we're looking for downtown. If you open one of those and you've got a good five-year business plan, then over the course of the next five years, we will, you know, you pay us interest only for that period of time, and we're going to write off 20% of your loan every year for those five years. In essence, it's like a forgivable loan. Um, they have other, other requirements in there, like you have to be open 48 hours per week. You have to locate in a ground floor location, but uh, nothing, nothing too onerous, just all the things that you might want. Um, deferred loan repayment. This is a great example from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. They had one block of buildings that was almost completely vacant and was kind of becoming a problem for them. It had vandalism and um, graffiti and they had some squatters in there. And they thought that if they could, because they had a big need for new restaurants downtown, that if they could bring a cluster of about eight new restaurants to this one block um, at the same time, that it would really turn the block around. Um, so what they did was they, they talked to established restaurateurs and the restaurateur said, we'd be happy to open a second location there, but you know, it's really capital intensive. It costs a lot of money to start a restaurant because the equipment and the furnishings are expensive and it takes a couple of years to build up a clientele. So if you can help us with that, you know, we'll do it. So what the city did was they used, um, I think it was $1.6 million of their block grant allocation that they had um, and basically uh, let restaurateurs borrow 70% of what they needed from several local banks who agreed to participate at pretty you know, decent rates. Um, but the city used its block grant money to pay off the loans for the first two years. And it, 
it wasn't a gift. They had to pay it back at the end of that, you know, at the end of that 10-year loan period. But they basically just pushed loan repayment back um, by two years, which gave the restaurant owners the time that they needed to build up the clientele and therefore be able to, um, to you know, keep the lights on without this crushing uh, repayment debt that they had to do. Brilliant success. They got their eight restaurants. They're still all in business. Um, I thought I had a picture of them, but I don't. Um, but a great program that really uh, dealt with a very specific need that they had. Those are the kinds of tools that you need to have in place. You need to have this sort of arsenal um, of incentives and capitalization tools to, uh, to make this work. Um, and finally, create some developers. I, you know, everywhere, everywhere I go, I hear communities talk about, you know, we need to find a developer for this. We're going to put out an RFP for a developer to develop this site. You know what, there is like not, there's not a factory where they're coming out of and they're looking for these opportunities. Um, the best developers are local. They're, they're people in the community who just say, you know what, I, you know, I bought a couple of houses, I think I can probably do this. I can work with a contractor who knows what they're doing. And there are places where you can get training on that. We really need to um, sort of make this a locally grown effort. Nonprofit organizations can serve as developers. CDCs can serve as developers. Um, local governments can serve as developers. Um, we just need to make that happen. And there are more and more communities that are doing exactly that and teaching people the basics of real estate development finance, teaching them about historic real estate, um, and making that happen. Um, and, you know, there are, again, I go back to crowdsourcing and crowdfunding, and you're going to be hearing a lot more about this. Thank heavens, um, it is such a great topic. But it's beginning to happen with historic real estate. This is a, a relatively new company in Washington, D.C. called Fundrise. It's owned by a couple of uh, brothers who are the sons of a local developer, uh, the Millers, Ben Miller. And what they're doing basically is saying, you know, okay, here are neighborhood commercial buildings. You people who live in the neighborhood, wouldn't you love to see this building rehabbed and have it become a new restaurant or have it become a new whatever it is you want it to be? And so they're, they're in essence selling shares of stock in these buildings and people are flocking to it. They're flocking to it. This is uh, their website and you can see that for every building they have kind of a profile um, they show you how much investment they've gotten, how much more they need to rehab that building. At the very bottom of the page, you see that they've got offering documents right there, so you can pop them up and you can look at their, their organizational documents and their prospecti um, and read it before you decide to do anything. And it's like, you know, $1,000 a share, $500 a share. Their first building was $100 a share. And then their website even has a video. Um, it's not playing, but it shows you, it gives you kind of a whole video of the street and how they envisioned the use of the building. Um, real, when you think about the potential for historic preservation and having local community members invest in small shares in preserving and saving historic buildings, it's a real game changer. And I think we're going to see a lot of things happening with that um, in the near future. Um, and the most important thing, of course, is to constantly innovate, constantly be thinking outside the box about ways to solve these problems. Um, steal ideas from other communities, but don't do things just because it's worked someplace else. Really kind of give it some thought to how you can solve things in a unique way. You know, you travel all over the world and you see these great, really, really old buildings. You know, we might have a building that's 150, 200 years old here. I think that's amazing. But you go around the world and you see buildings that are 500, 1,000 years old, and you wonder how on earth are these buildings still here? You know, what has happened that has kept this building um, here all these years? And it's happened because in every single generation, a person or a group has decided, we're going to take care of this building. We're going to mothball it. We're going to reuse it. We're going to rehab it. We're going to find somebody to buy it, whatever it might be. They've made a commitment to do that. You guys are the ones who are doing that for the Erie Canal Way. And it is a fabulous task you've taken on. It is going to make sure that the Erie Canal continues to be a fabulous historic place 200 and 300 and 500 years in the future that people have a very clear, distinct image of when they think of and they know, yes, here's what I'm going to find here. Here's the quality of the communities. Here's the caliber of the businesses. That's where I want to be. Thank you so much. I know you're going to succeed, and I look forward to hearing your questions. We've got, you can keep that, we've got 19 minutes here for Q&A or discussion. Um, and, and the first thing I actually want to start off and ask you is, there weren't any examples from New York in your presentation. Um, do, you, do you see things in New York um, that you thought were particularly innovative or exciting? Well, you know, I, and I intentionally didn't include New York because I, I, di I, didn't, I didn't want examples that people are going to know so well that they're not going to look at them with really open eyes. 
Um, so I tended to use things, ex except for the bad sprawl example, of course. That was from, that was from you. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, there are plenty of things here. I mean, I think that the canalway alone, I think, I think heritage corridors are brilliant ideas because, you know, again, like the mayor said, um, you know, communities never existed in isolation. Never, ever in history. They've always been interconnected. And we sometimes, uh, I think in the day, in the, in, the, in the era of, you know, separate jurisdictions and things, we kind of forget that. Um, uh, the Bowtie Theater in the corner, bringing that kind of energy and nexus here is good like to see more housing downtown. We talked about that earlier. Um, but plenty, plenty of good things here. Comments, questions? Besides you, no, just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead, in the back. Uh, if, I'm sorry, if you could say your name, where you're from. You said, uh, what is the importance oh, of a sorry. good strategy? Well, it's essential. I mean, it can't, it can't work any other way. I mean, it can, but um, it's not going to work well. And it, the thing is that with down, that, okay, so um, it is easy for somebody to come up with a great, a great idea for a festival or for some people to start rehabbing some buildings or to develop a couple of businesses. But um, downtowns are never going to be, they're never going to have the entire market again. They're going to have a piece of the market, and you have to be really strategic about deciding what those markets are that you're going to pursue. And yes, you want, you want things to change so that it gets a, a bigger piece of the pie as time goes on, but it has to be very focused, and that has to become the litmus test for the kinds of property improvements you do, the kinds of businesses you develop, the kinds of uses in the buildings, the kinds of marketing events that you do. And I can give you a very tangible example. Back in the dark ages, um, in the early 1980s, I was a downtown manager um, in Virginia, in, in, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, this was before Virginia had a statewide Main Street program, so we were kind of doing this on our own. And we, we were kind of scattered all over the board. We did, we still had this sidewalk sale that had been going on for, you know, 500 years at that point, and we had a Heritage Days thing, and they were just real yawners, you know? We just did them because they were sort of habit. And we, we kind of sharpened up and realized we essentially had two major markets that we had to get, kind of three, but really two. Uh, the first was downtown workers. We had 5,000 people who worked downtown every single day, and businesses were open from 9 to 5, and people worked from 9 to 5, so they couldn't shop. Um, one of my, my merchants told me, a business open from 9 to 5 is catering to the unemployed. You know, great, you know. <laughs> but if we could just get them to shift their hours to 10 to 6, you know, and make downtown deliveries, and if we did half of our promotional activity at lunchtime in between 5 and 6 p.m., Lo and behold, things started working. So that began to kind of affect everything that we did. Um, and then we had a university in town, and the university students had no idea that there was a downtown there. You know, they kind of got caught up in their own world. And so we focused really all of our ammunition at those two markets for five years consistently. People had other ideas for events. We were like, great idea, call us in five years. You know, it's just not going to happen now. Everything has to be focused on that. Um, and that's really what it takes is that kind of commitment to a very clear vision that's market driven and is based on what the community wants. Other question, yes, over here, name and, and where you're from, please. You, right there. Um, she's asking, I don't know if you all heard it, but she's asking basically about, you know, millenn like, you know, things always change. In the 60s, you know, if we'd planned downtowns for people who were in their 20s, then it wouldn't have been what we wanted now. You know, things, things change. And there are a couple of actually sort of underlying questions there. One of them is sort of the cyclical nature of economic activity, period. You know, in the 60s, we could not have anticipated the internet. Um, so, it, you know, everything, everything changes. And one of the great things, so this is kind of the second thing, one of the great things about downtowns is, and older, older buildings in general, especially older commercial buildings, is that they are infinitely adaptable. They can be adapted for a gazillion different uses. Um, I, I frequently go into communities where some 
you know, usually old geezer says to me, if we could just get back to the department store, everything would be good again. And, you know, I look down the street and I'll try to look for the building where I can say, oh yeah, you know, that, I can tell that used to be a blacksmith shop. If we could just get the blacksmith back, then life would be good again. Um, but, you know, but now it's a, an attorney's office. And, you know, those built, you can use the spaces for so many different things. Um, we're building a lot of buildings now that we can't, that you can't easily reuse, um, or that aren't built with the sort of forethought that historic buildings are. So, you know, one, downtowns are a great place for adaptability, and two, the market is always going to change, and that's why we don't do planning for 50 years. We do some planning for 50 years, but you do market planning for like 10 years out because things are going to change. Now, millennials, the reason that I think they in particular are different is because they have been affected by a couple of major sort of transformative things. One is they've seen their parents go through a couple of uh, market booms and busts, and so they've seen their parents now looking at a future where they might not have the retirement savings that they need to get by, and they're terrified, and so they're more likely to invest, and they're already doing it, investing in local things that they can touch and see and experience and shape themselves than investing in Enron or you know whatever it might be um, that their parents invested in. And two, their concern for the environment is really uh, going to be a game changer. Um, what I've seen so far with millennials is that they are, they're spending about 10% less on retail stuff than any generation before them did, and it's likely to stay that way. And if so, that means that we're going to see just less, less in retail sales in general in the future, probably for a generation or two. Uh, question back there, yes. That's why they're called independent businesses, because um, they're really independent. <laughs> they're really, um, yeah, that, 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 that often happens. I mean, the, the easy solution is to offer the, the downtown businesses the first opportunity to have the mobile vending units um, so that they're the ones who are getting the shot at it, even if it's just on a temporary basis, just one day a week or something to give them that shot. Um, and that often is enough to, to make it work. The other thing is just putting some real planning into how the street vending is deployed so that it's not just random, but it's like done in, a, in, in a, in um, conjunction with events or with a strategy to, yeah, let's get downtown business, business workers, downtown workers to, you know, to spend more and buy more in the downtown. And uh, to go back to the example of Charlottesville, one of the things that we found when we surveyed our downtown workers was that even though we had 21 restaurants that were open at lunchtime, these people were getting in their cars and driving out to the Strip to have lunch. And it wasn't that they didn't like our restaurants, it's because our restaurants were slow. They couldn't get in and out in an hour and get back to their desks. So that, that took a lot of work to get our restaurant owners to begin to think about how they can you know, sell something um, quicker. But our immediate solution was to change that pattern. We did a, um, gosh, uh, it was a, um, a live soap opera called Noontime Downtown. that went from 12.15 to 12.45, Monday through Friday for eight weeks um, in the summer. And it, we had a local a, a drama student at the university sort of draft this outline plot for the summer that was outrageously funny, outrageously funny. We had um, downtown workers be the actors and actresses in it. Um, we had a developer who gave us 2,500 bucks to get it started, so she got the lead role. Um, <laughs> and uh, it kind of like evolved from there. But what we did was we went to all the downtown restaurants and said, we're going to do this thing. We want you to um, give us a carryout menu that we're going to publish in a program that we distribute to every single one of these 5,000 downtown workers every week for these eight weeks so that they can call in the morning, order their carryout lunch. At noon, we'd had this local rock band record its own version of Petula Clark's song, Downtown. Um, when you're alone and life is making, and we blasted that up and down the street on loudspeakers so you would hear it and you would know it's noon, I've got 15 minutes to pick up my lunch and get to this little intersection where we did this event. Um, and it was a way to get the businesses, the restaurants, to sell their stuff in a different way um, to people there. If we'd had, if food trucks and food carts kind of existed back then, we probably would have used them and had the restaurants um, stock them with carts that we owned. Um, just to get the food out. Our goal was to increase lunchtime restaurant sales by 2%. We needed 50 people to attend the soap opera and buy their lunches from downtown restaurants. By the end of the summer, we had 2,000 people on an average day, and lunchtime restaurant sales were up 85%. It was, it was amazing. Um, I, was, I was only almost jailed once for uh, violating a sound ordinance and, and blocking the fire lane, but we got over that. Um, but you know that's sort of the that's sort of the answer is get the downtown businesses to be the ones who do the vending, and if they if they turn up their nose at the opportunity, you know, so be it. 
Mike. Yeah, he's asking about uh, the perception of the conflict between downtown development and neighborhood development, in essence. Um, they are both important components of a healthy economic development strategy for the entire community. I mean, you can't, you sort of can't do one or the other, and neither will succeed without the other, um, is the gist of it. When you think about the amount of investment that downtowns represent in, in, in public infrastructure, <coughs> in private infrastructure, in services, police, fire, ambulance, everything is already there and compact. It just makes sound economic sense to take good care of the investment that you already have in place and the economic engine and muscle that you have. At the same time, you've got to have housing and you've got to have close in housing um, so that you're you know, not, not, not making the downtown dependent on outlying shoppers and visitors to come in and you know, exacerbate parking problems for you. They've just, they've got to go, they've got to go together. And you need, especially for lower income neighborhoods, you've got to have proximity to um, jobs, jobs and services and businesses. Um, which is the reason that so many community development corporations are now getting involved in commercial district revitalization, because they think that they see that, that intrinsic link there. You can't have one without the other. Lisa? Uh, can I be, um, what are some tips and techniques for working with the independent businesses to get them to realize the vision that you're in the markets that you have identified in downtown? She's asking for some tips for working with independent businesses um, <laughs> other than the psychotropic drugs in the water supply, you mean, to um, get, them, get them on board. I mean, I think there are, there are several things that I've learned that are crucial. Um, one is that they are never all going to be behind you. And so you just have to kind of like deal with that. And, you know, the market, the market giveth and the market taketh away, and it will deal with those who kind of don't get on board. So there's what we call the 20-60-20 rule, where when you kind of wade into this, 20% of the people who are stakeholders in a downtown are completely with you. 20% are completely against you, and the other 60 kind of wait to see what happens. Um, so it's the 60% that you're really kind of gunning for um, to get them to, to do things. And you make it easy. I mean, they probably, I mean, if independent business owners don't have a lot of spare time to do stuff. Um, don't expect them to come to meetings. I had this kind of epiphany one day when I realized I wasn't getting merchants at the meetings that I was organizing. I could have the best trainer in the world come. They wouldn't be there. That the, they actually, their best contribution to making a downtown healthy was to run a great business. And if they were in meetings, they weren't running their business and thinking about how to do it better. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, not overloading it with information. Um, we used to like just summarize little factoids we learned about, you know, here's a, something interesting about women who work downtown. And I would put that on half a piece of paper, sometimes with cartoons, and slip it under their doors, you know, when they all closed at, you know, 4.59. And, um, and, they would, and it would have suggestions for like things you can do in your window displays, ways that you can market better, ways that you can change your merchandising around. And it would happen. You would begin to see changes occur. But if I'd given them a whole market report, it would have, nothing would have happened. You know, just another sort of layer of, of film in front of the eyes. Um, and making suggestions for small, small changes that can have a big impact. Things like changing window displays have an enormous impact. Um, it's really surprising. Adding one new product line. Um, rearranging things inside, shifting store hours from 9 to 5 to 10 to 6. Unless you're a feed and grain store, it's a great thing to do um, and can really work well. But I think those are, the, those are kind of the biggies. Um, Sorry, nobody, nobody here ever been to a feed and grain store? Well, they're open like at 5 in the morning and they close at 2 I, and that I, works for them. I, I'm from Iowa, so... Uh, yeah. No, there's this myth <laughs> about unified hours in downtowns. Unified hours work at shopping malls because it's exactly the same kind of business there. But in downtowns, you've got 50 yeah, no. trillion different kinds of businesses, so you can't do that. Do we have any merchants here today? Don't be shy. I mean, this is one of the challenges, frankly. NICOM conducts its own Main Street conference uh, periodically, and, and one of the challenges is they, they don't have times but to do it, but you, speaking to them is a, is a big issue um, that we struggle with. Who else? Yes, right there. Right. 
Yeah, she's asking about sort of models for creating your own developers. And there are several that are out there. One of the best I've seen actually is one that the National Trust did years ago called Community Initiated Development. It was a process developed by Don Ripkema, who many of you have probably heard you know, talk about economic development issues and preservation before. Um, they call it CID. And it's basically he created a manual and all the forms and things you would need to walk a nonprofit organization primarily through the process of either being a developer itself for a building or sort of, you know, breaking the log jams to make it easy for people to develop buildings, to redevelop buildings. And I think that's probably the most straightforward one I've seen and most dead on here because it deals specifically with historic buildings. There are other sort of training programs out there that deal with buildings in general, commercial buildings, but this is specific to historic buildings. It's called Community Initiated Development. Um, the trust outsources its, its publications now to um, Amazon, I think, which is, you know, <laughs> I wonder what happened that day, but um, <laughs> that's another topic. But, um, but I think you can get it on Amazon. It's called Community Initiated Development, and it's a, a big sort of book by Don Rifkema. R-Y-P-K-E-M-A. Oh, yes, Hannah. She's asking about, um, you know, if, 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 you know, given the impact of millennials, what I said was actually not so much to cater to them, but be aware that they're changing the market. They are, you know, whether you have many of them or not. And how do you, how do you sort of get more of them? How do you get them to move to smaller communities and what can you do? And there are a couple of things there. One is that uh, many of them are naturally coming to smaller communities. They, they like, they like good, they, they, they like unique, authentic places with a good quality of life. Um, and they often just don't know that the opportunities are there, so you have to reach out to them. And there are countless examples. A lot of the Kansas communities have done this in particular. Peabody, Kansas had a brilliant program a few years ago, maybe 10 years ago, where they went to the local high school and got lists of all the alums they could find. And because they're a tiny town, you know, there were like 10 people in town who could tell them where all these kids were now, like where they'd all moved. And so they contacted them, and they got something like 10 or 15 people to move back and start businesses there. Um, I've seen communities, uh, a community outside Detroit did this, um, South Boston, Virginia did this, where they offered this um, sort of rent to own program for downtown housing for younger people, where um, you basically, like the first couple of years of rent that you pay for a, a recently rehabbed unit in a downtown, probably exactly the place you were kind of looking for, um, the, the property owner or the developer put aside a percentage of the rent in an, in, in an interest-bearing escrow fund that they could then use as the down payment when they decided to buy the place and convert it to, a, to an owned unit. Um, so there are just, again, you know, lots of incentives. If that's your goal, there are lots of incentives you can design and put in place to, uh, to make that easy, um, easy to do. But basically creating the business opportunities. Um, and millennials, it's easy for them to see it because they're, they, they, to them, there's not a big difference between shopping in a bricks and mortar place and shopping online. There's this whole continuum of experience. And so they understand, oh yeah, I can locate any place with this kind of business and, 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 and I can have a global market. Um, they get that more easily than older people do. So um, they're, already, they're already tuned into that to an extent. A good place to look at for cool examples is Bristol, Connecticut. Um, Bristol is, um, do, do you guys know it? Have you been there? They, in the 1970s, they, they tore down, basically their downtown, all but one little block of historic buildings is left. Um, they tore it down and built an enclosed suburban style shopping mall right there in the middle of the downtown, 770,000 square feet. The mall failed, surprise, surprise, um, and it was demolished. It was acquired by the city and demolished um, in 2008 or 2009, I think. And um, so they now have this big vacant donut hole in the middle of their older downtown. And it's still ringed with establishments. They have the hospital and city hall are there. Um, a couple of industries are there, but the big opportunity that they've had is that ESPN is headquartered there, and you know the demographics of the people who work at ESPN are they're younger and they're fairly affluent, and none of them live in Bristol. You know, it's getting older and older and older, and they see nothing there for them to do. 
So through a series of sort of crowdsourcing activities, they have, well, well, A, they have a developer now who is working with existing property owners to rebuild a mixed-use downtown um, in Bristol, and that's actually, they're breaking ground uh, next month on that after a couple of years of planning. But through a whole series of sort of community-wide crowdsourcing activities that involve millennials, and especially the, the, the crowd from ESPN, they've now created something like eight or 10 new businesses um, in these few little vacant buildings they still had of the downtown. They have um, a couple of cafes, they have a brew pub, um, they have a billiard hall, um, I forget what else they have, but a bunch of businesses that have been started by people who are really excited by this. They, um, they launched their crowdsourcing activity by, there was an Italian restaurant in town that offered a free spaghetti dinner for anybody who came to their first organizing meeting. They had 700 people show up. It was like the old Chef Boyardee commercial with the tables down the street and everybody eating. Um, they now have you know, something like 2,500 members of this group called Bristol Rising who are all younger people who are through committees and online are really shaping that community's future and launching a ton of new businesses. So take a look at Bristol Rising at that website. Time is up, unless I get permission to go over. It's, it's a little bit more. All right. Well, we'll take Dan, and then we'll take Ball, and then then we'll go ahead, Dan. Make make it. This better be good. Yeah, um, it's a great point you make. He's talking really about sort of stabilizing buildings before before there's a user there, you know, so that you don't lose the asset. And that's something that I think communities don't pay enough attention to. And when I look at, I constantly like sort of inventory interesting incentive programs and capitalization programs that are out there for, for downtowns. And I don't see that very often. There are a couple of places that I've seen that have specifically created stabilization funds or mothballing funds, um, or that are sort of playing around with land banks and their application to historic historic resources. Um, but not nearly as many as I'd, I'd like to see. Um, I think there's more a tendency to kind of, you know, jump for, let's find the user um, to put in here, rather than let's just take care of this place for a little while and know that it's going to come down the road. Um, Green, uh, um, and Greenwood, Mississippi was a good example of a place that did that. West Point, Mississippi, these are really teeny towns. Um, they have both done a good job with that, with um, mothballing buildings and protecting them, and starting with a tight core and cluster, so that instead of trying to spread activity out on the entire street, they're saying we're going to use this node to begin to plant activity and have it kind of radiate out from there. Um, but yeah, there needs to be more there. Paul? Yeah, full buyer, smart growth director in New York State. Um, the governor and the legislature just this past year fixed our tip statute to allow schools to opt in. Uh, and what the, the main benefit of that is it makes tips more viable. But the subtext for me is tips seem to be an opportunity to bridge that gap between schools and community revitalization. In fact, uh, appropriate we're here Schenectady because the school district here is pushing for a tip, pushing for this law to build downtown housing. Are you seeing any movement outside of New York um, uh, on the part of schools recognize and interact with uh, community revitalization Yeah, it's a great question. It's sort of, it gets to the heart of what has, you know, there, there are, I, I sort of love tax increment finance. I think it's a great tool. It has been abused in the country and it gets kind of a bad rap from that. Good Jobs First kind of hates it because, you know, Walmart has used TIF, you know, to pay for construction of buildings that they clearly don't, they don't need the incentive and it's not a good use of the money. Um, so it has its detractors from there, but school districts have been a big opponent of TIFs around the country historically too because, although it makes no sense to me, it's like if investment doesn't occur, then you're not going to have your increased tax base, so you're not going to get the revenue anyway, so why not share it? But I think that the, the best example I can think of that's recent is in California, where because the state government gutted 
um, redevelopment authorities, there was like no more TIF in California all of a sudden a couple of years ago. I mean, it's kind of existing in other f forms, but essentially it was gutted. And school districts, which had really opposed TIF there for a long time, were all of a sudden like, wait a minute, where did this go? We actually really need it. And I, so I think they, it's kind of like the donut always seemed to go, they don't, you've got till it's gone. They appreciated the fact that it wasn't there. And so we've seen some real turnarounds there. Um, communities like Carlsbad and uh, Del Mar, Oceanside, I mean, lots of places have really like kind of gotten, you know, back on track and like, oh yeah, we've got to collaborate and really make this work and bring it back. Um, so I think that's a great place to look for good case study material because they've, um, they've suffered from, from not having that collaborative relationship and that's, what, and that's what it's going to take to get it back on track there. <laughs>